What's good chess people? International Master David Proust here with the third week's installment of professional chess lessons. Uh, most instructive games or segments of games or moments from the PCL, Pro Chess League games. And uh, today we've got quite a chaotic game for you, but I'm going to try to uh, shed a little clarity on it through a couple moments. So um, first I'm going to play through this game so you have a sense of what we're looking at real quick with very, very minimal narration. And then we're going to dive into a couple key moments um, to sort of understand a position that uh, is difficult to understand. A peace sacrifice for a sort of positional purposes and a long-term battle that, that develops from that. So hopefully, hopefully what will start out looking like just craziness like you've got no idea what the evaluation is and you just want to pull one of those things where you go it's unclear shrug um will become something that you have some kind of a handle on um all right so we've got an a6 modern from black and uh white gets a very nice position with this timely capture on c5 if black takes with the knight they lose the b pawn so white opens the d file to start shenanigans on Put some pressure on black here, and uh, if black accepts this pawn sacrifice, this piece sacrifice on d5, it's very bad for black. After queen d5, hitting the rook, and then bishop c4, so black plays something else. And here white decides to sack a piece to really get things going, rather than retreating the knight and, and trading. Kicks the black queen somewhere, and penetrates with his queen. And this is the position after white has sacked a piece for a pawn, and uh, it's a position that is super complicated. We're going to try and figure it out a little bit. White's developing, developing. Black's trying to untangle something with his king and that bishop. And, uh, and now black is trapping white's queen. <laughs> That's his counterplay. This queen who penetrated is now alone and really surrounded by a thicket of black pieces here. Um, white has some, some tactics themselves. The queen captures a pawn, but she's still trapped. And uh, now it gets now it gets intense. There's obviously weird tactics going on here. You may wonder what these are about. Later you won't. And we emerge to a position here where white has three pawns against the piece in the endgame. Black immediately makes a blunder by capturing this pawn. And after bishop d5, the knight is attacked and knight e6 is threatened. And from here, white picks up a rook for free. And now white has an exchange and two extra pawns. Uh, or an exchange in one extra pawn. And white is easily winning from here, but eventually goes on to draw after another 30 adventurous moves. Um, but our interest will not be in the blunders that followed here and what kind of a crazy, uh, what kind of a crazy sort of back and forth can happen when people are on a two second increment. Our interest is going to be to understand that super complicated position and uh, you know whether it was good for white or black, by how much, and how each side should have played that position. So I will bring you back to the moment of the sacrifice. Um, white's position would have been perfectly good if they didn't sacrifice. For example, knight e3, queen d2, rook d2. White has a very pleasant position here since they're going to have the c4 square for a piece in a moment and you know black's development's a little bit lacking and it's perfectly pleasant for white so white sacrifice is definitely played based on white's idea thought conception that they will have the advantage here um and not just on the fact that they would get to score two checks um so uh here's the first situation that we get to um and here we can give our first evaluation. Should this be good for white or black? What do we think? Um, well, this is a peace sacrifice, first of all, that's not based on immediately attacking and checkmating the black king. Okay, when white plays f4 here, the goal is not to immediately play f5, crack everything open, and checkmate the black king. Why is that not the goal here? Well, look at white's development. White's development is not yet complete. In fact, the development of white and black is pretty comparable here, right? White has three piece, pieces participating in the game, the queen, the bishop, and the rook, and black has three pieces more or less contributing in the game. Um, you know, plus his king and queen provide a little bit of self-defense there. Um, so development is not like a massive advantage for white, actually. And uh, white's not yet poised, like focused in on any targets around the black king yet either. The closest would be the knight on e7, but... 
you know, white doesn't have any ways to increase the pressure on e7, and uh, black can defend it with bishop f6 in extra time if necessary. So that's not really the main thing that white has here. Um, what white has is actually um, that the black pieces are a little bit tied up and hard to untangle, um, that his queen is on a strong square, the black has two weak pawns, of which white is very likely to regain at least one if they want to. For example, in this position, do you see a way for white to regain a pawn? If you saw queen takes c5, good on you. So, you know, it's very plausible that white recovers at least one more pawn and has two pawns against a piece, which becomes, you know, a minor material investment. If white then captures the pawn on e6 or b4, it becomes three pawns for a piece. So, White has that going for them. Um, and also white has the possibility of basically restricting the black pieces with a duo of pawns on e4 and f4. That duo of pawns would keep the black pieces from being on strong outposted squares maybe and give white a kind of compensation black based on the black pieces not being able to move very well. Uh, which to me is a little reminiscent of the Cochrane Gambit in the Petrov. the type of sacrifice that we're talking about to me looks a little bit like this opening. In this opening, is white going to immediately attack the black king? No, where's the white development, right? What white's going to do is establish a strong pawn center um, to try and keep the black pieces from coming onto good squares. Back to our situation. Um, in this position, um, I think the best thing that white can do is play the move knight h3, a flexible developing move. Um, I think this is better than white's plan of playing f4, because I think that the move black wants to play next is probably knight c6 no matter what. Um, in most circumstances, I think that's going to be black's best move. Um, <clears throat> for a number of reasons. So let's say play king b1 stupidly to show it. Knight c6 is going to defend this knight extra. It's going to open up this bishop so it could come to d4 or uh, e5. It's going to start encircling this queen, keeping her off of c5 and preparing the move rook to a7, which is a very important part of how black might try to struggle out of this position would be by attacking this queen with his, you know, while developing this rook. Um, so all those things said, I think that, you know, I think white plays f4 because uh, he wanted to put his bishop on c4 targeting e6. Okay. And um, personally, if I could play knight h3 and expect black to play knight c6 and then play bishop c4 anyway, then I would rather, for white, much rather have this move knight h3 than the move f4 in this context. Okay, the move on knight h3 has possibilities of knight f4 and knight g5, which are quite strong, and it connects our rooks. So we've got the possibility of quickly playing rook d6, which coordinates with this piece to pressure e6 and pressure this knight, and then the next rook coming over to help it. So to me, most logical and strongest move for white here, definitely knight h3. And I think if white plays knight h3, they have an advantage and their sacrifice was good and sound and a good choice um, given, the, given the position that they had. So I would totally support white um, playing this way. And uh, yeah, I think um, we can imagine this position going perfectly well for white after um, something like bishop c4, threatening rook d6, bishop d4 to prevent rook d6, uh, bishop takes, knight takes, knight g5, um, winning the pawn on e6. And then white just continuing to play this position. Seems plausible. Um, you know, it's, there are millions of branching variations in this, um, in this position, which I don't want to get bogged down in because they will keep us from ever figuring anything out. But, you know, you can calculate moves like c3, trying to get the bishop out of the way of rook to d8 and, um, yeah, I mean, we can calculate king g7, king f6, king g8. There's like millions of things to calculate. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that this is the proper approach for white is bringing out um, these pieces quickly. And it's more flexible than spending a move on f4. So white plays f4. Black plays knight c6. 
white plays bishop c4 and here we're going to take a second to talk about what i think black would best do and what i think black should best do is block off the d file and come into this d4 outpost um, in the game black plays bishop f6 looking at trading white's piece and what this reflects is both players overvaluing the bishop on g5 in this game um, it seems like the bishop is exerting pressure on a pinned piece and therefore it's natural to be concerned. This piece is attacking me. It's putting pressure on me. I want to deal with this piece. Okay. The reality is that whenever this bishop, uh, that if this bishop ever trades the bishop on g5, white played knight h3 in the game, white's going to get a knight on g5, which will be at least as good as that bishop was, but probably, in my opinion, stronger than the bishop was. So it's not, you're going to spend time, right? Like, imagine that black now did this. What has black done in the last two moves? They've moved their bishop twice, who's now off the board. What has white done in those same two moves? So it's also, it's a net time losing operation, right? To challenge that, to spend your time challenging that bishop with a piece that's already developed and then trading it. If white's able to, to defend and recapture with moves that are building their position, then white is gaining time during this process. And white's position is even better now than it was two moves ago, for sure. Okay, so, but the other thing is both players are overestimating the value of this bishop. This bishop actually has very, very little mobility, right? The only thing it can really do is capture on e7. Now, if black's in no danger of losing the knight on e7, then that's not much of a threat, right? Um, and if that's the only thing the bishop can do, then it turns out that probably white should just do it because the bishop doesn't have much of a future beyond that. Um, that said, the bishop on g7 has the potential future of getting shut down by the move e5 at some point, and then saying like, uh-oh, maybe I should have done something with myself. So that also plays into why I think bishop d4 looks like a strong move for black, getting into this outpost, blocking out white's rook, getting out of the way of e5. And by blocking white's rook, black gives themselves the option of playing queen to d8, as well as the sort of like rook e7 type idea. Um, the other interesting way that black could try and defend a position like this would be to play the rook a7 move um you know you're going to chase the queen and you're going to come to d7 to challenge this file and um yeah then white's gonna probably trade and take a pawn and now a6 is hanging as well and uh you know white's going to want to continue developing from here and white's got two pawns and and some and some, you know, pressure or compensation for the piece. But this is a legitimate way for black to defend as well. This rook a7 move is quite quite a fair defense here with the idea of coming over to d7 and preventing rook d6. Okay, so those are the two ways I would recommend defending for black. Both involve sort of challenging this d file um, quickly. Or, I mean, one challenges it, but, you know, keeping white off of this d file, keeping white off of the move rook d6. So, in the game, black plays bishop f6. And uh, white plays knight h3, which is a great move, defending this, um, but also in some lines defending the f4 square with the knight against queen takes f4, as you'll see, king to g7. Um, now white plays rook f1, defending this pawn with the rook, because if rook a7, queen here, bishop takes, he wants to bring the knight to g5, and he doesn't want to allow queen f4 check, king over, and then queen centralizing in the middle of the board on e5 uh, in some position so that's why the rook is on f1 it's actually this this move actually is a super slick strong move it seems like it's just blocked but it's got a lot of potential white has options to play f5 or e5 and this move actually at first i was like hmm it seems like white should just be bringing a new piece to d6 right like that's the plan pressure this thing attack c6 and e6 how could this be the wrong move and then i discovered that if bishop takes knight takes queen f4 check is not that good for white right? Like losing not good for white because they drop heavy material here. And uh, I played with some other variations and quickly found that actually allowing the black queen to f4 is like a big no-no. And uh, white's move of rook f1 is actually pretty slick because it stops that. And then I also eventually started finding variations where f5 was good and I put it all together. And I'm like, okay. So this move is very slick. Um, now black played bishop d4. And white plays e5, locking that bishop away from the king side. And here's the other moment where white has just made a very important mistake, and I want to show you the right approach for white in this position. The right approach is to trade off this guy here. He can't do much. He's keeping your knight out of the way. And black's entire counterplay here is based on playing either rook a7 or queen d8. 
messing with your queen. Now this game partly attracted attention and seemed brilliant because white let their queen get trapped. Okay, awesome. The game is super flashy after white's queen gets trapped. But you know, there's a simpler way to do this and it's not like the game would look ugly for white if they did. So first of all, queen takes, white can take back on c6, right? Then white's up a pawn with positional advantages. So we're not gonna look at that in too much depth <laughs> or at all. Um, knight here. All right, so now we bring in, now I think, We've prevented rook a7. This bishop can't move. Um, so now, the next thing we want to do for white is actually sack this rook, I think. No, maybe I'll play f5 first. Both work. Both work. So you can play rook d4, f5, either way. But you play f5. So first of all, if queen d8, white has f6, and the bishop can't take back because of the queen. So this f5 move has prevented black's defense. Well, Black's got a whole bunch of different like options for how to play this position, but um, none of them is particularly good. F6 is basically a pretty heavy threat. Um, you know, Black can play G takes, and then their king becomes open. Um, so I'm just going to look at one variation for you, which is E takes. I'm going to sack the rook for white now and play knight G5. Do you see how removing this knight on C6 has suddenly left Black unable to do almost anything they wanted to do? And eliminating the bishop on g5 has given us this move knight g5, which has, you know, new options like knight f7, keeping black from tucking their king away. Uh, this position here is nearly a Zugzwang for black, like a nearly just can't do anything situation. If queen to d8, we now have queen e5 because we traded off that bishop. And king f8, queen h8, king h6, knight f7. So black's just... Black's just paralyzed here. There's almost no move that they can play. Um, and, at, and at some point, white will be prepared to play e takes f5, bishop takes f5, and then rook takes f5 with the idea of knight e6 check. Or e takes f5, bishop takes f5, knight e6 check, bishop takes e6, rook f8. So at some point, white will be ready to play something like that. The other thing white can do, which they could already have done last move, is play bishop d5. And it just traps this piece um, and wins back some significant material immediately for white, right? Um, leading to, you know, white just having a positional advantage. But I think white's position is so good that this move here is even better, and it's very, like, instructive and classy to see that, that after this knight move, there's just nothing for black to do, basically. Nothing nothing to move, nothing to do. Um, so that is how white should proceed. It's only, like, a three-move long variation, right? So super calculatable for strong grandmasters like the ones playing here. But this kind of move, bishop takes e7, is the kind of move we just simply don't consider trading the, like, offensive attacking piece for the pinned piece, okay? People often think, like, this piece is bad because it can't move, right? And this piece is strong because it's exerting pressure on the piece that can't move. But actually here, we're trading it not for the knight on e7, but for the knight on c6. And the knight on c6 is extremely strong. It's almost trapping our queen. So that's the solution to this whole position in game and reveals... Um, reveals the strength of white's position once you make that once you make that trade. Rook takes d4 is pretty classy as well, um, giving white queen e5 and preventing queen d8. So that's that's a nice detail as well. Anyway, real quick, so the game goes e5. Black plays rook a7, and now basically the position is rightly speaking a mess. Um, white's queen cannot get out of this, um, and I'm pretty sure that black could have won. Let's see. I think black could have actually won in a number of ways at this point, pretty much. It was pretty bad for white. Like, they could play queen to d8 and just trap the queen with a queen trade instead of trying to win the queen. Now, if this check, um, the king can, you know, get out of the way. Which direction? Over here? Here? I forget. Well, why wouldn't white be able to draw like this? Oh, yeah, because we come here. Um, and the point is that once the queens are traded, white still has, like, you know, one pawn for a piece, and now they're in an endgame. So we don't need to, like, win the queen with rook a7. With rook a7, it's more complicated. Um, you know, the queen sort of gets trapped over here. I think in this position also, bishop d7, if I remember correctly, is is winning. Um, with the idea of knight to c8 or queen to b8. Um, just keeping everything defended. Um, he plays rook b7, queen a6, rook b8, trapping the queen. 
but white can trade off on e7 and that basically avoids losing a queen right if the knight takes the queen's not trapped if the queen takes queen takes on c6 so black just has to go for this forcing variation it's super complicated he doesn't go to g7 because this will be check and then white picks up the bishop on a6 and what black wants is when white um takes the queen black wants to take this piece and end up just winning everything um, which is why white has to throw in bishop e6 check here, forcing the king somewhere where white can take with check. But now white doesn't have a bishop here to take this, so white moved the rook away. And the resulting position, white has managed to grab three pawns for the piece. And this endgame should have been very complex and interesting and balanced from here, I would say. close, Somewhere close to equal. Um, but black immediately made this blunder, and then bishop d5 with knight e6. And then it was just tactics and tactics and tactics, um, which we're not going to all go through. Okay, so I hope that's clarified um, for for you and taught you something about this interesting position after white sacks the piece. Um, first of all, what is white's compensation here? That it is not necessarily this attack, but it's this, this difficulty for black to untangle and find squares for all their pieces. It's, will this queen on c7 be strong or weak? Will she paralyze the black pieces and keep them develop, from developing? Or will she get herself trapped? Right, that's this important dynamic in the position and then that both players want to try and like white wants to develop flexibly if possible um keep pressure on black and the black wants to untangle are the goals of the two players and that sort of like the winning deciding factor between those goals was really the realization that this bishop on g5 is not that good so black shouldn't have spent time on bishop f6 white should have traded on e7 as soon as they could and that sort of like factor is really decisive in this uh, particular PSAC position. All right. Well, I hope that's great. Um, see you in the future um, with more videos on the uh, YouTube channel for both Pro Chess League and Chess.com. We've got highlight videos on the Chess.com channel, lesson videos on the PCL channel, full replays of all the action of all the broadcasts on the PCL Pro Chess League channel. So, yeah. See you all later. Enjoy, enjoy the matches this coming week.